But we first, we bring it on Pastor Stephen Pisario, uh, founder of the Church Inc. And I think you said you're in Hartford, Connecticut, right? He has a book outside, look like a fired up book that's going fire for the Lord, amen? Be sure to check it out there. And the thing about it, uh, it's not a thing that you know, you, you, you're pumping yourself up and pump, promoting yourself, but you need to hear what God is speaking to the church, what the Spirit is saying to the churches, amen? We're, we're two of the seven churches mentioned in Revelation. We don't want to be the other. Been the persecuted church and the faithful church, amen? The Smyrna and the Philadelphia church, we want to work towards that. As uh, Reverend Carey was saying, you know, it's not about the, the, the size, because we heard some testimonies what people have done with, you know, what people say, oh, some, some pastors, then to get big hit, I'll get into that when I get into session later. In D.C., oh, you got all, under 50 members. You don't have any members. We don't have any members. They're disciples of Christ. They're Jesus members, and we want to be part of that. And they look down on you, you know, you don't have a hundred million, you don't have a thousand all like, they look down on you all like that. But they're not your members, brothers and sisters. They're part of the body. So we're going to bring on Pastor Pazario, they call him Pastor Paz. Pastor Paz, that's, that's a good one right there. And he'll tell you about his ministry. And then we're moving on to Pastor Jeff Gwynn, and then Pastor James Beckley. Soul winning strategies for Christ. Soul winning strategy for Christ. How many want to be a soul winner for Christ, amen? amen? A soul winner for Christ. It's not that you get them saved, but you get them to the one who can save, amen? Amen. amen. Give him a round of applause as he come on now, amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah for the man of God, amen. Amen. Praise God. So good to be here, and uh, thank you for opening the, the doors of the house of God for us and uh, for that awesome lunch and uh, and I'm glad to be here it's my first opportunity to come and uh, worship and fellowship with my AEA family and I became part of AEA family in 2009 uh, graduated the seminary and um, it was really it was a long hard and, and prayerful uh, decision to to go through that route because you know God has a will and a plan for everybody's life amen and man has a will and a plan for every man too and I wanted to serve God and in my heart I knew what I was doing for God was serving God and I didn't need a piece of paper from a man to tell me it was okay for me to go out and preach and win souls and it sounds kind of interesting or funny maybe even that I say that because I do understand teaching and, and, and being trained and being discipled, but it's still at the end of the day, it's, it's a piece of paper and God looks at our heart. And I went through the process of seminary and, and that so that I could show myself approved and learned and qualified. And at the end of the day, I do the same exact thing I do and did before seminary and before licensure and ordination. However, it does open doors. And, and, and there was a tremendous amount of, of you know, information that I was able to download. And uh, it really helped me to understand and, and also understand the process. Also to help me, you know, as, as so many of what has been spoken about today here, we're talking about the church and the condition and the heart of believers and what God sees and, and where we are as a body of Christ and where we should be. And, you know, the process sometimes of reaching people who have perhaps gotten a little uh, off track, part of that training I understood, now I was able to understand through the, the training and through the education process and and really I was more made aware of a lot of theologies and doctrines and you know things that were out there and it, it, it allowed me now to go back and and shore up you know my own personal apologetics and the ability now to say hey brother you know we're we're in this together you know have you considered this 
and, and try to help steer people back and, and get people back on fire and not about the numbers and not about, uh, you know, the reputations and all the titles and all the things that people are trying to do right now. And so, and I was really, really excited to find a, um, an agency like the AEA that would base, you know, their acceptance of somebody like me on my credentials of having completed studies, but also of my heart and my passion and, and results for serving God. And so I'm very, very, very uh, excited to be here. And I was asked to come and minister on strategies uh, for soul winning. And I, I thought to myself, well, that's great. But then they said, well, you've got to do it in 15 minutes. <laughs> and I said, okay, you know, Lord, you've opened a door. So how would you have me to walk through this door? And the epiphany was that, you know, I had been trying to, you know, put together books uh, for a number of years, and I just could never bring everything together. And so when I was asked to come down here, uh, I agreed, and uh, let me introduce at this point, uh, came down here with my wife, who God allowed me to meet her, introduce her to the Lord Jesus Christ, and then I married her. And that's Mona, and I love her so much, and I'm so thankful to God for this blessing in my life. Um, but I sat down, and I said, okay. All of a sudden, a book that I've had percolating inside of me for decades began to flow. And the book that I believe God used me to write for him is called Reaching Into the Fire. And what I've done is I've taken this, uh, what I had created was a series on evangelism called The Fishers of Men. And I put that into this booklet form, which is more of a workbook. Um, one of the editors that took a look at it said, Pastor, this, this isn't a book, this is a sermon. I said, Amen. Amen. It's not a book. I'm not, I'm not a book writer. I'm a kingdom of God tool that is sold out and willing to sit down and spend eight weeks on the spur of the moment and write something down to present to God's people to help them to impact this world that we live in and win souls to Christ. Now, I will say this, that every testimony and every lesson so far today, and this is just rock solid confirmation things that I've compiled and put into this workbook. So I hope that you will uh, come and visit in the back. And you know, this is a workbook. I, I, I know there's not a whole bunch of people here, but there's pastors here. And there are people here who have ministries. And my desire would be that you would take this book and, and buy a bunch of them. I mean, I brought 90 down. And, you know, take this back to your church and, and use this as a tool, a Bible study, a teaching or something um, to help, help get the fire back. And you're not going to find this as a book of a, um, uh, you know, a real exciting book where you're going to want to jump around and shout. And, and it's not a fiction book. It's a workbook. It's a, a self workbook. So this message is to the church. It's a book for the church. And it's 20 years of, of my blood, sweat, tears, praying and fasting and seeking God, um, and it's here. And I thank God for the opportunity to bring it and share it with you. Um, and let me, you know, I have uh, so much to say, and I apologize, I'm a little, a little scattered at this moment, but... Um, when well i'm going to read a, a scripture here actually it's uh, ephesians we're all very familiar with it. we talked about it a little earlier today uh, ephesians and the office of the evangelist is is sometimes quite often actually uh, misinterpreted or misunderstood for personal evangelism people often think of an evangelist is someone who's going to go out and win all of the lost but I believe it's different. The office of the evangelist is to, is, and was given to the church, okay? And when the church is in that place, 
the body of Christ goes out and produces fruit through the area of efforts of personal evangelism. And so many people, I've heard it so many times, well, you know, that's, that's not my gift, and, but that's our, those are our marching orders. Okay, so it's not a matter of uh, being gifted, it's a matter of obedience. And so, you know, in Ephesians 4, uh, just real quickly, um, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So God's never changed his mind about this. But what I've discovered is that, you know, we aren't allowing, through our disobedience, we aren't allowing God's idea of what ministry is to reign in the church. And as a result, we have what we see. We see staleness. We see stagnancy. And we see just people building themselves up. And we, my brother, we talked about that. You know, 10,000 people churches. But fruit for the master's table. How many? How much? Okay. And so, again, you know, the book, I talk about that. We're talking about the wheat and the tares and fish and, and all this good stuff. Um, now, I have another thing I wanted to talk about, and that's uh, how many people believe in handing out gospel tracts? I, I, I'm shocked to find out how many say, no, no, no. You're not supposed to do that. That's not the way. This is God's gospel tract to us. Okay? And so many times I've been in a position where I could feel God just, you know, burning inside to speak something to somebody, and they're gone. At a bus stop, in line at the, the cafe. A gospel track is one a seed. It's something that you're going to put in that person's hand, and they're going to take that, and they're going to go on their way, and they're going to read it. And you know what? That's how I got saved. I was out looking for an apartment, and I went to look at this particular house, and across the street I saw another four rent sign, and I walked across the street, and I'm looking around, and no information, no phone number or anything. I turned around, and I was walking back, and there was a woman standing there. I said, hey, brother, here. Thanks a lot, lady, and I was gone. And I took that, and I believed in God but certainly didn't have a personal relationship with him. and I knew nothing about salvation. In fact, was told by my, uh, my religious priest that it was okay to commit suicide. Thank God I didn't. <laughs> However, uh, I got home and, and I had this piece of paper and I looked at it and I said, it had God on it, so I respected that. I just shoved it in the glove compartment and I uh, got pulled over for speeding or something and it was out on the floor and I picked it up and I read it and I put it back in. And this went on for about a year. And every time I read it, I was so stirred and I was so moved by whatever it was. I could not tell you to this day what it said. But it moved me to the point where I just put it back in that glove compartment. And I ended up, uh, you know, going through a terrible, terrible uh, experience. My father died. I was in a, uh, now, I don't look like it, but I'm a former Golden Gloves boxing champion. I was invited to go train with Mike Tyson. And, uh, and then I got run over by a van. And uh, so the devil has been eyeing me for a long time. And at the end of the day, I came to a point and I just cried out to God. I mean, I knew God was real. I, I, there was something inside of me that just said God was real. And if you're really real, I need to know now. And a uh, turn of events, one after another, I ended up meeting a man who said, hey, you know, let me tell you about Jesus. And he brought me to his church and I got saved that night. I came down to an altar, which is another point, pastor. Is this your altar? Because I don't know how many are aware right now. The altars are being torn down in the churches. Okay? And God showed this to me. I've made three travels back and forth from the East Coast to the, to the West Coast. And I have been in uh, so many churches from one end of this country to the other. The church has done away with the altar. Now, in the Bible, what is the, what is the first thing that the enemy did when Israel was conquered, they would tear down the altar of God. 
And what is the first thing that God instructed Israel to do when they conquered? Tear down the, the idols and the altars and build me an altar. This altar, brother, right here. This tear stains flood this place because that's where it starts. All right? It's right here. It's not about, I mean, you know, if you want, we talked about it with his brother, you know, if you want a lot of people to fill the seats, and I've talked about this in the book, you know, you want people to fill the seats, so you have to build a bigger church and take all that kingdom resources and put it into building a bigger church so that you can have a lot of people. I call it storehouses for the tares. Okay? I'd rather have disciples out. Thrusting in the sickle and winning souls to Christ that are going to be disciples, that are going to be, you know, warriors, because we're in a war. How many people realize that? Maybe you folks do because you're here. But we're in a war, and we ride under the banner of our King, Christ Jesus, the Lord and King, and we're behind enemy lines. We are. We have been inserted behind enemy lines. And we're in a war for kingdoms and for souls. And we need to take that serious. And I know I'm going to be running out of time here uh, very quickly, but um, I have an interesting little uh, uh, exercise. I wonder, are there some people who would volunteer? It's not the Army. We're not going to send you to KP or anything. But anybody willing to volunteer? Hands up. Please. Okay, come on, sister. Stand right over there. Come on. I need another volunteer. Another volunteer. There you go, sister. Brother, would you join me? And your lovely wife? <laughs> Come on, brother. Stand with me. Here we go. Thank you. Because I'm not really not asking, actually. <laughs> God bless you. Brother, here you are. All right. I got a couple more. I got a couple more. Come on. Sister, join us. Sister, would you join us, please? Okay. Um. Well, you didn't actually line up any order. I gave them to you in a particular order, and that's my fault. But you all have a number on the back flap of your, your envelope. And I guess since we're out of order, it doesn't matter. Just praise God, we're out of order for Jesus. All right. Brother, go ahead and uh, open yours. I don't want you to say anything or do anything. Go ahead and open. Everybody open your envelope. And... Soul winning strategies starts here, right here. Brother, would you just go ahead and, and read your first line? Glory, honor, and praise to the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brother, go ahead. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Merciful Heavenly Father, forgive me. Father God, have mercy. Mercy, 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 Father God. Hallelujah. Holy, holy, holy Lord. Holy, holy, holy Lord. Holy, holy, holy Lord. Father God, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ for the lost and the dying. Father God, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ for the lost and the dying. Father God, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ for the lost and the dying. In the name of Jesus, Father God. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Father God. In the name of Sister, Jesus. Go ahead. Jesus, Savior, Redeemer. Amen. Jesus, name above all names. Amen. Jesus, Lord, help me. Amen. Now everybody all together, read your card, read your card. Like you mean it. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. 
for the fields are ripe unto harvest, but the laborers are few. Hallelujah. Brothers, sisters, church, this is where it starts, right here. It starts right here, and it doesn't end until the hot tears are flowing down your face for the lost, for the dying, for your unsaved loved ones, for the co-workers, for those who are under the demonic influence. This is how it starts. And that's really all that I can say other than we're not God, we're not the Holy Spirit, but he has a plan. And if we allow him access to our heart, <laughs> if we allow him access to our lives, to our substance, there's a, there's a tough one, our substance, and our time. Each and every one of you and everyone here, you are all personal evangelists. And where you work, where you play, everywhere you go, that's your vineyard. God has let it out to you. And as a church, as a body, as you gather the troops and go out and take armed with the tracks and the word of God and the Holy Spirit and go out into your communities and thrust in the sickle. Thrust in the sickle. They're not going to walk through the door by accident. We're going to go out and get them. We're going to go out and catch them. Fishers of men. So praise God. Thank you. You can keep the card as a souvenir. <laughs> God bless you. Everybody say hallelujah. 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 Amen. Now you've got some strategies and techniques and, and so forth. Tracks, oh Lord, we bombarded so many with tracks. We got specifically Halloween tracks. Because our children, when they were younger, uh, they got a, a vision from the Lord. It's not Halloween, it's COG, children against Halloween. And we used to have a bunch of children over the house when the church was in the house. And when we went to the warehouse and we told Pastor Maria about, and, and I think it was somebody else, so Pastor Ed and, 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 and Joanne, Joan, uh, we have all these kids there, and we would show them movies about the true meaning of Halloween and why they didn't need to be worshiping as a holiday. Tracks, tracks do a lot of that. Give them another hand of applause. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. We want to bring on Pastors Jeff and uh, Tracy Gwen. We notice, you notice in their bio, they stay out of the country, I guess, probably as much as some of us stay in the country. Haiti and other, was Paraguay, Haiti, Ecuador, India, all those places. And I know they have some strategies because when we were at the graduation, Pastor Ed, they had a statistic that the bishop from New York gave uh, as a guest speaker that you think we're in the minority. We're really in the majority. He said in 1900, there were, was it one for every 360 people were Christians. And it went down until it got to the 1990 or something like that. Do you know it was one out of three are Christians? That's more majority than minority, amen? So, so strategies, they'll probably be able to give you, because there's revivals going in places like Columbia. There are revivals over in Guyana, Pastor Henry. There are revivals going on all along. So we want them to come up and give some of their strategies and techniques for winning the loss at any cost. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I feel like this microphone has an afro. It's an awfully big. <laughs> it's a bald one. Okay. <laughs> I like bald better. <laughs> soul, winning, soul winning strategies for Christ. Um, when I was asked again for uh, 15 minutes to uh, to share just uh, what we do and, and what I. Uh, have experienced in, in our ministry. Um, 
for me, you know, we're evangelists, and for me, it's like talking about the air. It's it comes so natural because it's something not that I craved or, or desired on my own, but God birthed it within us. And um, there's nothing more that I want to do, nothing greater that I want to do than to to share my faith with others and to uh, help others find their way. And uh, uh, just a real quick poll here. Um, if you got saved in the church or because you stumbled into a church by mistake or whatever, let me see your hand if you got saved that way. And if you got saved because of a relationship outside the church, somebody introduced you to Christ or some other means that way, let me see your hand. See, the rest of you, we're going to have an altar call because not everybody raised their hands. So... <laughs> Might want to get that out of the way. <laughs> the evangelism starts now. Um, what I what I've learned to uh, realize is is uh, um, one word is love. Christ came here. He loved people. He loved he loved us so much that he died for us. And it was out of that love that he he was able to uh, um, minister and to win people for him. And a lot of times, I mean, there's. Um, hundreds upon hundreds of books on evangelism and the uh, the do's and the don'ts and this and that and everything. Um, all that aside, everything comes right back to this one book, the Bible, the, the one example, the best example that we have to follow. And uh, I'll read real quick, Matthew 28, it says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And I think uh, um, a lot of times, first of all, I think the, uh, the uh, concept of church, which, which I agree with, I think is, is great in what it is. It, it was designed for the believers and uh, to come have a place to fellowship, to grow, to be encouraged, and to get filled up, to go back out. And uh, today, I think a lot of times we build these buildings and, and have these churches, and we say, all right, world, here we are, come to me. And, uh, and that, that's not the design. Here it says, it says go. And uh, how many people here like to fish? Any fishy fishermen here? Anybody like to fish? Okay. Have you ever fished in an aquarium? <laughs> Got to get out. There's a whole sea of, of fish out there. That's when that's what we're doing a lot of times. We're you know, even um, you know, I know people they they'll uh, they'll bring people to church and expect the pastor to get them saved. I brought them. I brought them. Get them saved for me, man. You get them saved and bring them to church to grow. It's James 1.27 uh, says this, and this is out of the Message Bible. It says, real religion, the kind that passes muster before God the Father, is this. Reach out to the homeless and loveless in their plight and guard against corruption from the godless world. Most of those people, the, the homeless, the, the ones that are struggling, when, when they're down like that, they're not thinking, I need to get to church. What they, they don't know what they need, but it's up to us to go out and do that. Um, Tracy and I have here in the, uh, people ask us, you know, what do you do for your ministry? And, what do you, and we're, we're kind of all over the place because it's, it's, if there's a need and somebody needs Christ, then we're there. So if it's, um, you know, Paul says, um, I become all things to all people. When he's with the Gentiles, he does does what they do. When he's with the Jews, he does what they do. And and that's kind of the model we want to follow after is that um, if if somebody's got a leaky pipe and I can fix it, man, let's fix it. If that's gonna if that's gonna show the love of Christ and help to draw them closer to Him. If if there's a, a family living out in the woods, let's get out and get to know them. Let's not go out and preach at them. Let's build a relationship. Let's love them. Let's show them Christ's love. And, uh, and so we started doing that. We started going 
um, up here at Wickham Park. Um, we started back in August. We've we learned of a, uh, a lot of homeless people living in the park in tents. Some with families as young as uh, kids as young as three months old, living in a tent. Teenagers, and so we were out there doing an outreach with some other uh, friends of ours, and and we've really felt like this is. Uh, um, an area that maybe be, maybe is forgotten. The Catholic Church will go out and they'll give money and, and some things like that, but they're not really getting ministered to, not out at this place. And so, and, and I believe that the chances of them walking into a church is slim to none. Um, they, they don't look good. They don't smell good. They, they have a bad perspective of Christians because a lot of them have been judged before for different things. And I really felt like, well, the church needs to come out to these people. And uh, so that's what we started doing Sunday mornings. We started going out to the people, and uh, we'll take coffee and donuts and juice and just some snacks like that, and uh, we'll get set up out there. Real simple, just just my family, um, no big production, and uh, go out there. Once we're all set up, we go around to the tents and, and uh, tell the people we're here, and next thing you know, we got 20 people sitting around um, having church with us. And... And uh, stepping out in that obedience, God has, um, um, I guess, expanded my faith because I began to see things that I haven't personally witnessed before. We had a, uh, a lady out there who's a, a practicing Wiccan. If you know what that is, that's, that's, that's a cult. And uh, a 40-year-old lady with uh, three teenage daughters living in the park. And she, we're, she came to the service, and uh, we're sitting there. And uh, she didn't make eye contact with me the whole time I'm talking. And I felt like um, when we're done cleaning up, I said to Tracy, I said, I think I need to go back and talk to her when we're done. I felt like there was something I needed to say or something more needed to be done. And so we got all done cleaning up. And I turn around. And when I turn around, she's standing right there. And uh, I said, can I help you? She says, she says, can you pray for me? This is somebody who, who uh, is a practicing Wiccan. She prays to the devil. And I said, well, I said, absolutely. I said, what do you need prayer for? And she says, the doctors told me I have cancer. Cancer runs in my family. And, and uh, she says, I, I'm scared. And I, I explained to her again about salvation and, and what that means. And she says, well, I'm not ready for that. And I said, well, I believe that God can still heal you. And so uh, we, we got around her. And uh, we prayed, we believed for a healing. And uh, when I went back to visit her a couple days later, she had already gone to the doctor. And uh, the doctors couldn't find a bit of cancer in her body. It's, you know, we've, um, there's a, a, the three-month-old baby that was out there. Um, the same time we prayed, got, um, had a respiratory problem, real bad breathing problem. And uh, we prayed and the baby was healed that week. Um, you know, uh, we, we see people come to the Lord. We've, there's a lake right there. We've baptized people when they get saved. We explain what it means to be baptized because that's the next thing. And, and we just disciple them and we talk to them. So really soul winning strategies for Christ, um, begins with love relationship and, and being available. And it begins out here. This is, this is for us. This is for the believers. This is for, for us to be encouraged and now, granted, people come into church and they get saved, and that's great. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen. But, um, you know, it says go. Go out into all the world. And uh, uh, so for us, you know, those, those kind of things have worked. Um, I'll just share one more quick story as far as um, some of the stuff we do. We, um, I was called by a uh, caretaker for an elderly couple. And... Uh, she, they're married for 60 years. She's suffering um, really, really bad with dementia. And uh, he takes care of her as much as he can, but there's somebody that comes in. And so the caretaker actually called us and said that when uh, she goes to get in the shower, she can't lift her leg. It's just a small curb, but she can't lift her leg. And so she scrapes it over the tile every time, every time she cuts her leg. And... The husband just he he calls me in. He says, "I don't care what you got. I don't care if the bathroom floods. Get rid of the curb so she doesn't keep cutting her leg." And so so we went in for our initial visit, and he shows me what 
what he wants done and what he'd like me to do. And, and uh, when we're done, we, we sat around the table for about 15 or 20 minutes, and I got to share Christ with him um, in his 80s, never, never heard the message of Christ. Um, I sat around for 20 minutes, got to pray with him, share Christ with him, and uh, I had a friend with me at, um, had gone to look at the job with me, and, and when we're walking out of the house, he's, he asks me, he says, how much do you think if they had to pay somebody, how much would that cost or would you charge if you were charging? And I said, probably about $300, not a, not a big job. And he says, he says, did you see that ring on his hand? He says, he had some pretty nice things in there. You think he could afford $300? And I said, you know what, he might, might have been able to. But never in a million years could I have knocked on his door, sat at his kitchen table, and talked to him about Christ. He wouldn't have let me in. But I used the gifts and the tools that God gave me to be able to get into his house. I don't care about the job. That's, that's just a bonus for them. Um, our objective is to get into the home and to be able to pray and to be able to lead. We've seen people come to the Lord through that. Through the, And uh, so... I, you know, I guess that's my time, and uh, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to share something that's just such a, pa- it's, it's God's passion, and he's, he's made it my passion, and Tracy's passion, and, and uh, this is what we, what we do. Thank you. I told a story about my granddaddy, who was an old primitive Baptist preacher and pastor, and his thing, you know, hard shell, if you're from North Carolina or know anything about that, hard shell, they, 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 they got benches harder than the floor, and they don't have no pianos and all like that and everything, but the Lord saved him. He saved him, and he saved my father at 103. I mean, really saved him. You know, it was like the type of thing some of the brothers have already mentioned. It's not that you give the pastor your hand and guard your heart when you get in there, you give the pastor your hand, you give him your wallet, and you join that church building. That's the type of thing. You're not giving your heart to Christ and whatnot. And when he really gave his heart to Christ, it was like a whole nother thing. You know, 60 some years in a church building, but the relationship with Christ was a little different. But when he changed at 103 and, and whatnot, it was another world. Because he went to glory at 105, almost 106, and he was a different man. We're going to bring on uh, Pastor James uh, Begley and his wife. He'll bring you some perspectives on the freedom, wholeness, and counseling. And let's bring him along with that. He has a wealth of information and many years in uh, Christian counseling and counseling. That part that uh, Pastor Ed mentioned, the wonderful, the counselor. We are to be like counselors to the laws. Amen. Come on. Let's give him a hand as he comes forth. I sat under a lot of the, some of the teachers that are teaching the stuff that Pastor Ed was talking about earlier. I didn't believe any of it, uh, but I see, I've seen it with my own eyes and heard it with my own ears what's going on out there. It's in the name of the church. Uh, as far as the teachings, rewriting the Bible, uh, the revisionists. Uh, I'm going to share today. I, I'm, I'm from Maine. There is Holiness to Freedom pamphlets and stuff out there in the back. You can read that. Uh, this isn't about me. My testimony is God. Uh, there's, 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 uh, uh, back up just a little bit. I pastored uh, in Maine for over 25 years. I was 31 years old when I came to this thing called the church with zero church Bible Christian background. So I came into this thing called the church without a clue what it's supposed to look like, act like, sound like, Christianese. I don't know. I didn't know what that stuff was. And I got hurt a lot by religion, but I wouldn't change that for anything. As I was praying about this strategy, and I was, I've been weeping for weeks, uh, talking about setting up the, uh, the altar of the Lord, rebuilding the altar of the Lord. Okay, the wake-up call. How many of you are familiar with the wake-up call? It's going across the nation. It's going across Brevard County. It was setting up groups in people's homes, grassroots, rebuilding the altar of the Lord. And uh, 
things are happening. Miracles, teachings, people are coming to an awakening of uh, who God says he is. And there is a difference between who God says he is and who man says he is. Um, so at 31, um, the, the testimony is about God. And this comes down to a one-word strategy. Uh, and um, the uh, 31, as I just said, no prior. Um, the... As it comes to this right here, I'm going to have to stick with what I have because if I don't, I'm going to be all over the place after what I've heard today. I feel like I'm on overload. Uh, this, uh, this Bible, these are not stories. These are encounters with the living God of all creation. And we miss that in our religious Western world view of what the church says it is and sometimes it isn't. Yeah, but these aren't stories. Man sees a crowd. All through, even through Scripture, man, you look at how man words this, it says a crowd. God never sees a crowd. God sees every man, woman, and child with a name and a face. Father God, he's the, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, and there is no one in between whom he does not know personally. And he knows that, that each one out of his kesset, his heart, his, his loving kindness, which draws to, draws to repentance through the heart of the cross, through Jesus, okay? And um, coming to strategies, we are trained in our culture a lot of times of, about strategies, our programs. And if you look up the word strategy, usually it's used with uh, military, economic, political, psychological, all that kind of stuff. But always ends up in some kind of a program to produce results in the form of numbers. And this isn't about numbers. No one in this room is a number. Everyone in this room is a human being, is a person created in the image of God. And so strategies... Uh, not a program. When I was in seminary, uh, I was in school at 31, freshman in college, seven years full-time year-round. And that was a trip and a half. My oldest daughter told me, Dad, if you do it right, we can graduate together. I did, and she did, and we did. And um, But one of the courses that I took, uh, this was in, in a, I'm not even going to name the school, it doesn't make any difference. But one of the courses was Seven Steps to Salvation. And it, I, in here, it didn't set right. I, no. It, what's, so I put up my hand, being the new kid on the block, a new believer, and I put up my hand, and Professor Carpenter, I said, uh, uh, I, I'm, I don't understand. I said, in my life, in my experience of God in my life, uh, I, it was, I was lost, and now I'm found. Once I was blind, now I see. Once I was that, now I am this. Once I was that, now I am this. You add it all up. The, the, the one point of salvation is Jesus. I didn't understand it. I still don't understand it. I would tell God this day, I tell God, God, I don't understand this, and I don't want to. I don't want to end up thinking like religion thinks or like the world thinks. I don't want that in here. And, uh, and so this whole thing of strategy and Coming to God and experience him for who he is. I had a personal encounter with God. I grew up without a father. I go to church. At 31, I hear a message. I didn't have the language, but the pastor was just a wonderful, spirit-filled man of God. And he was talking about how marvelous the love of the father. Well, that didn't go very well with me. I didn't, you know, it didn't connect. And it was uh, the following Sunday, I heard the same message. Two days later, I gave my life to the Lord. And because I encountered the love of God in my heart, I physically felt this God come and touch me. And it went right through me. And that's a whole different story, but uh, there's a lot more to that than just that. But um, the, at the time uh, when that happened, I was a dead man walking and did not know it. And I never heard, no, no one ever came to me and talked to me about this. No, I, I didn't hear this stuff. Now, I knew what a church building was, but I didn't have a clue of the God, much less the personal God behind it. Now, and the fact that I'm in the ultra-liberal, northeast state of Maine, liberal, you know, all that kind of stuff, there's still no excuse for not, being, not hearing the gospel truth of the Father's love. There's, there's, uh, you know, church, wake up. The church needs to wake up, the true church. I'm not afraid to use that word. Paul uses it. The true circumcision, those who are, are true believers. 
How many of you know that there are a lot of Christians and a lot of churches know a whole lot about God, but they don't believe God because they don't know the difference? They're belie- and I'm not, that's not a put down. This, we need to look at reality. We need to look at reality so we can start speaking the Father's heart through here. If we can't do that, the, the church, the, I'm talking of believers, are the only authority on the earth that can speak on behalf of God. And that's by his design. That's by his design, not, not ours. If peace, I love this stuff in Scripture. I just, I just love Scripture. I love the Word. And, uh, you know, where he is, workmanship, created for good works, etc., preordained before the foundation. That's Ephesians 2.10. From day one as a believer, I've had a line. i got one in this Bible right there. You can see it. From 2.10 over to 3.10. So that the multifaceted wisdom of God would be made known now through the church. And so we're the vessel, the instrument for the love of God to come through. Going through this as I was praying, uh, the strategy, and God gave me a scripture, and I'm going to go to a scripture. I, 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 if, I, if I share the scripture, you're going to be looking at scripture, and I'm going to be going over here, and you're just not going to follow me. So God showed me just to use the scripture to bring this all together. Um, the strategy that he gave me was impartation. Impartation. We all know this up here, but how many, we're bringing this down, Holy Spirit speaking to Spirit, and Spirit speaking to Spirit. Pastor Roy Pike, it was an impartation by the Spirit of God or the Father's love of the Father's heart directly to me. And I physically, emotionally, mentally uh, experienced that. The Jesus is on the, the throne. He is the head of the church. Correct? This means yes. Okay? This means no. Okay? <laughs> and we are on the earth. He is the head given by God, placed by God, Ephesians 1.22, to be head over the church, the body. Therefore, we are a literal extension of the head who is on the throne. You getting that picture? And so the body, uh, as, as the, the, the body of Christ in the earth, in spirit speaking to spirit, uh, turn to Revelation, uh, turn to 1 John 1. Uh, in Revelation 19.10, while you turn to 1 John uh, 1, in Revelation 19.10, it says that the spirit of prophecy, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony in our lives, of Jesus in our lives, is the spirit of prophecy, and prophecy is the one gift that does what? Builds up and edifies the entire body. Because again, it's not about us, it's about God in us. And this is what I take out there. I'm meeting with pastors all the time. That's one of the things I do uh, as a pastor, uh, as a pastoral counselor. I'm out there meeting with pastors, getting, you know, uh, building relationships and networking. Uh, I mean, I've gone all the way from the streets to, uh, I'll sit down and talk with anybody. And I, I, I love that, just sharing the love of the Father. And, um, and so the, the uh, impartation the, the, the heart of the Father as a strategy of, of winning people, of bringing people to the love of the Father, bringing people into that saving relationship of God is impartation by the Spirit. Uh, in uh, 1 John 1, what was from the beginning? What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld and our hands handled concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, that you also may have fellowship with us. And this is our fellowship, indeed, with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. That which we have seen, which we have touched, we have handled, we have heard, we, in this encounter, this encounter with the living God in our lives, is the strategy of impartation by the Holy Spirit of God. And we, as the body of Christ, the embodiment of, of who he is in us, one thing I can say from my experience of God 
and is, is love to me, is that I know who I am because I know to whom I belong, period, end of story, and I do my best to live out of that with me- mentorship through the body. None of us are, are excluded from that, and I, I, all ministry flows out of relationships. He is the one who imparts to us, in us, and through us. And I think those are three words that God is dialing up to the body. What God has given to you is not yours to keep. Who you are, you, you, you are who you are because of the one who lives in you. And, and what, that which he has graced to you is not yours or mine to keep. And so the impartation, getting this picture up here, we are ambassadors, we are children of God, whatever word you want to put in there, we are his creation to whom, in whom, and through whom comes the impartation of the Father's heart, the impartation of the Father's love. You know, going back to the miracles, I've seen miracles, even in in Maine I've seen miracles, five tumors gone. Eyes opened. I've seen that. And that what, what we refer to as the supernatural should be the natural in the body of Christ. Because it's not about us. It's about him. He's the one that's doing this. All I am, all we are, are vessels. Again, impartation, letting the Holy Spirit flow. I'm a pastor, but Jesus is the minister in the sanctuary. That's in the book. And so we hear God speaking. And as a pastor, we had, I'm going to stop with this. We had eight of us pastors in Maine. This didn't happen overnight. Now, this in itself is a miracle. We had seven, eight of us pastors that literally, I know that's only three, but seven or eight, literally flowed in and out of each other's services. Because when we heard from God that a pastor had a word for, like, for example, in our congregation, I sat down, believing that God was speaking. And guess what? The people loved it. We taught to this, taught it to the congregations. Pastor called me one night and said, I believe God is stirring a message for Sunday morning for Midcoast. That's where I pastored. Sunday morning, he came. I said, if God confirms that, you come. And he did. I sat down. There was a Southern Baptist, uh, uh, eight, eight different congregations, okay? It doesn't matter which. And I'm going to close with this story uh, from a Southern Baptist uh, pastor who for 52 years, he came to me, and, you know, Southern Baptists are great at getting groups together and going out across the country and helping other churches. And um, he came up to Maine, and the uh, pastor of the Southern Baptist, where he was, he and I were close friends. And to uh, make a long story short, he came to visit us at our prayer meetings. He came into some of our services, and he called me one day, and he said, Pastor, he said, I need to talk to you. And I said, sure. So we got together. And he said, I I need to know what's going on. He says, I was troubled when I came in here, when I saw the vision. And the vision is is on the brochure. Mission and creeds come from man. Vision comes from God. And there is a difference. Okay? And uh, he said, when I saw the vision that was written up there and heard what was coming out of your mouth from the Father's heart through you, he said, I was deeply troubled. He said, you should have a packed house here. We had, at the time, like a year old congregation, maybe 25, 30 people. And he said, I was troubled. And he said, so I started talking to your people. And he said, I, I, I'm convicted. He said, every single person said the same thing, that they experienced God's love in their lives. He said, for 52 years, as a Southern Baptist around the country, I examined church programs, growth programs in the churches, and what we're supposed to do with them to increase the numbers. Tears started coming down his eyes. He said, after 52 years, I would give anything to have what you have here. And so it's the impartation of who God is in us. His love is healing. I, I my weeping is that the church, we're not there yet. That's why we need each other more than ever. Coming alongside, we need us. The, the people of God will rise to the degree that the shepherds of God will stand and together walk with him. Amen. Thank you.